That's not the topic that doesn't work, it doesn't, it's okay. But this one always works, it's mine. This is uh, Windows 7? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Windows. Normally, it shows here on the screen or something. I don't know why it doesn't. Actually, if I can unplug here, F7, I do duplicate. Normally, that works pretty well. Here. Ah, good. Now it works. Okay, let's get started. Thanks for coming. Um, as you see, Kepeng is not uh, here this time, so I will have to run the run the show myself. I distributed an agenda to the mailing list. I hope you've seen it. Um, I received almost all slides. Uh, but before we look at the agenda, I briefly wanted to walk you through some of the milestones. Um, one thing that I highlighted here in red is uh, the publication of the use case and requirements document with RFC 7744. Um, thanks a lot for the work. What you will also see there is that we are a little bit late um, on the on the architecture document, and we may need to talk about the uh, uh, milestone adjustment for the solution document as well, depending on uh, how the discussions go today and what we actually expect to have um, done by the time when we send it to the ISG. And I, I posted the mail to the list about this. I um, didn't got that much response. Um, there are a couple of choices on when we could actually when we would move um, a document forward. For example, is when we just feel it's uh, it's good enough, and uh, when we have some reference implementations ongoing, uh, test uh, tests done as well, and so on. So there are a couple of possibilities for this meeting. Um, I was thinking about organizing it or participating with a group in the hackathon, but there are many of the uh, participants who worked on implementations are unfortunately not here this time, so uh, that didn't make a lot of sense. But with the next IDF meeting in Berlin, the situation may be different, and I'm, I'm still considering that. So we may actually push the delivery date of the solution document after the next IDF meeting to take some of that feedback, feedback into account. But I will um, briefly talk about the implementation work a little later as well. Um, what else did I want to say here? Um, oh, uh, Thomas is, by the way, the meeting minute taker. If someone is on Chabab, please uh, let us know and relay some of the, uh, the feedback. Good. Good. There's one um, document on the agenda for today where we are going to ask you for HUM to pick that document up as a working group document, which will then be added to this list. Uh, which is the CWD, the, the CBOR web token. Uh, uh, Mike is going to talk about it. I don't see him in the room yet. Hopefully, he will show up in time. Yeah, oh, the implementation efforts. So that I'm aware of um, um, a few efforts. Um, there's one, Ludwig is uh, having a project at six, an implementation project. I didn't, I couldn't reach him in time to get some more details about this, but uh, he would be able to post it himself, I'm sure. Um, 
my, I myself have been involved with uh, Samuel and uh, Eric on an, on an implementation which we um, started at the uh, Brock Hackathon, which was uh, summer last year, and also showed at uh, DECCON. And we are currently looking at um, how we can release the code, particularly since summer. Um, but hopefully that will be made available because it's uh, useful. It, you don't have to re-implement the smartphone app uh, to work over Bluetooth Smart with uh, some of that stuff. And the last one where you can sort of participate is, uh, and also already now, is um, Eric is working on a uh, proof of possession enhanced um, authorization server, OS2 authorization server, so you can uh, play around with that. This was... Um, sort of when we did the hackathon uh, implementation we were using one of their internal uh, server which is closed source code so obviously that's not available and we needed a substitute and there are obviously lots of different choices uh, um, starting a new authorization server implementation from scratch versus uh, reusing some of the existing stuff and um, I, ho I hope some of you can also contribute to that effort since uh, the proof possession implementation can then be reused also with working in OR. So there's some other code going on, like um, coding effort that uh, Justin Richards started uh, and posted to the OS list. So also have a look at the, the postings on the OS list to see what code is actually available. But this specific code um, I'm mentioning here is just um, for a specific extensions which are not, which are not part of, um, of OWASP uh, and also include uh, some of the the Seabor uh, cozy stuff. Good. Um, before I get to the agenda, um, I also want to make you aware of this workshop uh, that's going to happen the week before, or the, a few days before the next IDF meeting in Berlin. And it's a, it's a security workshop. It's, a, it's called OR Security Workshop, but um, uh, we're also looking for contributions that relate to ACE any sort of security investigations that you are doing, whether it's implementation related stuff, some other projects or formal analysis uh, is welcome. The position paper deadline is uh, end of May. And uh, we organized this um, after some re security researchers uh, did some analysis of OWASP formal analysis uh, last year. And we met with them in a in per invitation only workshop um, end of end of the year in the week before Christmas. And it was so um, such an interesting discussion to hang around with the researchers for a week and discuss different OWASP things. So I think it was mutually beneficial. Uh, we learned a lot from them, but they also uh, got a better understanding of what's going on uh, with our current work. To actually, the idea is that we create better ties between the research community and uh, the standardization community so that's that's the that's the idea. Think about it. Um, Time-wise, I think it's it's uh, it's quite nice. Uh, if you happen to travel to Germany already for the IDF meeting, you um, pick this up as well on the way. It's in Trier. That's where one of the a group of researchers comes from. Um, so anyway, so here's the agenda. Um, uh, Carsten will very briefly um, talk about the actor's document and, and the current status. Uh, he doesn't have slides, it's, it's a short talk only, but um, we should also f sort of think about how to proceed with this one. The majority of the uh, working group meeting will be spent with uh, the solution document. And then we have, uh, Mike is going to give a presentation about the CBO web token, which I mentioned earlier already. And then there's a, um, you will hear a little bit about this um, security for low latency group communication. And I haven't see, seen Sandeep, nor have I received anything from him. So that's uh, good to know. Um, so presumably he's not going to give that talk. Um, so I will talk a little bit about it instead. Good. Carsten, uh, you want to jump up to the microphone to say a few words about the uh, actor's document?
Right, so what, what? Hello? Is this working? Yes. I just have to be very close. Um, one of the problems with these informational documents is that, that uh, when an IETF comes up, everybody is looking at the solutions documents and, and uh, doesn't have time to work on the informational documents. So uh, maybe we should uh, actually continue what we uh, did uh, on the way to this meeting and actually do the uh, work on the architecture, uh, architecture document uh, more in, the, in an offline way. Uh, so right now we have a couple of reviews that uh, still need to be put into the document. We are also waiting for a couple of additional reviews. There were some people volunteering in uh, Yokohama that haven't put in uh, their reviews yet. And I would expect a revision of, of the document to be ready in May uh, so we, um, if we, for instance, schedule a virtual interim uh, in May, we might be able to, to finish uh, the document then. So I think right now the main concern, apart from, from lots of very good editorial comments, it's very useful, um, the main concern is that, that there are sections 7, 8, and 9, uh, which maybe are uh, not as useful as, as the early sections in, in the document and would require more work and maybe dragging out uh, the work. So we have to uh, consider how to handle uh, these uh, sections. But I think this is best done offline. We don't need to, to waste face-to-face uh, -face time on that. Yeah, the um, virtual intro meeting, is, um, it's a good idea. Who, um, time-wise, that would, for example, be end of May. Um, who would be uh, willing to participate in a, in a virtual intro meeting, i.e. telephone conference? Do you have guys Probably not just about the architecture document. <laughs> okay, of course not. Uh, yeah. Sounds good. I see about uh, 12 hands. Perfect. So I will, um, Bing and I will arrange something, distribute a doodle ball, find out the suitable time, and then uh, go ahead with this. Um, do you have any idea on how, uh, when we could finish it or should we just uh, sort of try to get it, publish it at the same time with the solution document or what's your preference? I mean, well, I have no idea when we will publish the solution document, but um, again, we need just one more round of, of editing and, and make a few decisions on those uh, uh, later uh, sections. And uh, we should have a draft uh, by, by the start of May. Uh, and um, I think that should be it then. Okay. You never know what comments you get. Yeah. So the um at the so we had a uh, a telephone conference call in this group um I think it was in beginning of March or so and uh, there were a few people who volunteered to review the document uh, we got one review in uh, but we actually Michael got well. Michael Richardson yeah okay cool uh, so we got two out of the four in and uh, neither Sandeep and Robert is here so I can't uh, put them on the spot here but. Um, I don't know if you, who who has read this um, this architecture document, one of the the last one, the last version or one of the earlier versions. Uh, just to give you, it's actually yeah, I see two, four, six, eight, nine, nine hands. Um, hmm. So it, it, it's nice if you volunteer to do a full review, but it's also nice if you just uh, uh, shoot uh, one or two paragraph uh, comment to the mailing list, so we know you have read it. And, and what is your impression, uh, th th that is also useful. We need those reviews, but the other ones are also useful. Yeah. Do we, do we have anyone who volunteers to do a review, like in the next few weeks? Dave, oh, that's good. Thanks. Anyone else? Anyone who has time on the way back home, read through the document? So it's oh, so it's actually not. Uh, you, uh, was that I thought it was Robin Bill, Winton, Walton, but it wasn't. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. That, that's right. Good. Cool. Yeah. So you have the comments already, but you just haven't posted them to the list. Okay. So maybe you can do that uh, right now. Um. Cool. Thanks. Go, go ahead. 
it's it's always difficult um, with these documents. We started them before we had, uh, or we had when we at the time when we had m multiple different solutions, and now um, we've uh, focused on one. And so obviously the our sort of attention shifted a little bit. Right. I'm um, sorry. I didn't really want to take up worker group time, but it is kind of an interesting question because it's unique to this document as opposed to OAuth. So anyway, I'm sorry, I'm Dave Robin. Um, anyone coming from OAuth coming to this is like me very confused uh, reading halfway down the document until you get to one magic expression down there that says for the purpose of this document rs is assumed to be a subset of the real device that is hosting resources and as is assumed to be some subset of the real authentication server the reason i that's a problem is because there are several diagrams that say ro controls AS and RO controls RS and RO owns RS and RO owns, you know, there's language like that. And that's great for the Internet of Things because it's a thermostat or it's a device. And chances are the RO actually does physically control the entire thing. But I don't control Facebook's AS or their RS, nor do I control the utility that own, but I am the resource owner. So the correct terminology here in terms of someone coming from OAuth is that the, o, the RO controls the resources on RS, and the RO controls the policies about the resources that I own yes. on the AS. So, but the diagrams don't show that. The yeah, diagrams we, we, specifically say RO controls this device, RO yeah. controls AS, RO controls RS. So I was, I was marking it up and objecting all the way down until I got to a sentence that says, for the purpose of this document, RS is simplified to be just the resources in the device that hosts multiple resources. Yeah. But I, so that statement is there. That needs to be way at the top and say True. RS and AS in this document do not mean RS and AS from the OAuth RFC. It's a it's a, it means a subset. Yeah. So that's my that's my beef with the document. And I don't know if other people had already talked about it or other people already thought about it. it, it, it the rest is editorial. But to me, right. coming from OAuth, coming to this one, it's very jarring because it says the RO owns these things, and in fact, he doesn't. It's always a problem if you are uh, reusing terminology from a different... Exactly. Group. And uh, I think we already have made some, some changes in that direction in the current uh, document, but we probably have to go for, further. Right. And I so think the, that's the question from. to the group or whatever to think about is, do we want to reword it so that everywhere it says RO controls AS to be RO controls policies about resources that he owns on AS? Or do you want to say in the first paragraph, RS and AS mean something different here than they do in OAuth? Just that's the issue. Um, so um, I assume that in your review, you, you, you're going to say that. Right? Yeah, well, my review yeah. started out tearing up the diagrams and saying this is yeah. all wrong. So it doesn't, it doesn't match OAuth. So and then I found the magic sentence that says, oh, yeah. wait, they mean something different here. So, but did you, did you think that... Um, that the architecture document was useful at all? Yes, or, yes, I think uh, it's excellent. My, that, it, other than editorial, it's just this reuse of AS and RS to mean the subset of AS and the subset of RS that I own, I find very confusing because it okay. doesn't match my mental model from, from OAuth. Okay. Yeah, please Thank drop uh, that note to the list so we can actually rearrange things a little. So I, I see Thomas moving, which, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So there Just might be a more. Jabber comment. Are we done? I think so. Thank you. That was quick. Hello? Hello. <laughs> it does work, does it? Okay, so I'm Johan Selander from Ericsson. I'm going to talk about the solution draft. I brought a cold um, here, so I, I might stop coughing in the middle of the presentation. I hope you can bear with me on that. So, 
Are you fifteen slides? Yep. Okay. Next slide, please. So yeah, this draft is targeting the the uh, solution milestone, the authentication and authorization solution. And what we did in the first version of this draft was that we tried to show that OS 2.0 is with some modification um, it's, it's a good good fit with the IoT deployments and in constrained environments. And what we what we're now trying to do is to make the scope more precise because there are pretty many different kind of IoT deployments. So we need to um, make this manageable. And we had this virtual interim meeting in the beginning of March and following with the discussion on the mailing lists. And the purpose of, of this slot today is that we should try to summarize what were the outcomes of this virtual interim meeting and progress the work further. Next slide, please. So this slide is, for those of you who um, know OAuth, this is an attempt to summarize the main points which we bring in from OAuth. And for those of you who don't know OAuth, there is uh, another slide, slide six, which is more or less saying the same thing. Um, but this is what we do. We, we take the token and the introspect endpoints at the OAuth, um, as the authorization server. And we introduce a new endpoint called the authorization info at the resource server. The purpose of this is to transport a, a access token to um, a resource server using co-op. We are using POP tokens and we consider the authentication of client and, and resource server to be the POP method. There are a couple of new claims introduced one which is enabling profiling, essentially specifying what deployment is, is being used, and another claim which is referring to a authorization information format. And then we make a lot of use of CBOR and COSI, and in particular the CBOR web tokens, which uh, Mike is going to speak about later today. Next slide, please. So this slide is going to show you um, what, what is the high-level problem statement and, and solution that we are working on. So if you, if you look at, at um, the variety of Internet of Things deployments, there's, um, there's a difficulty in, in trying to, to grasp what, what, should, what scope should we, should we use in, in, in uh, sort of what, what is the, the scope of, of, the, of the problems that we are going to address. And we also have this use case document, which is illustrating the large variety of, of different settings. And the way we do this is that an ACE solution consists of a framework, which essentially is this OAuth profile, and it consists of one or more um, ACE profiles detailing certain deployments. And we had a, a lot of discuss on, discussion of this on the interim meeting, and a few takeaways from that is that we may have different AS profiles which are not interoperable, but the framework should be consistent with different profiles. And the rich client should be able to support uh, multiple AS profiles. Next slide, please. And here's a picture which is trying to show some more or less the same thing. We have a, an, a red box at the top and the black box at the bottom. The red box is supposed to illustrate the framework, the OAuth profile, which is looking at the token and the introspect endpoints and the messages being exchanged with client, between client and AS, and between RS and AS. And in this setting, we are not focusing on the communication security that's out of scope. So how the OAuth messages are protected, authorized, um, and how authentication is done between client and AS is not covered in, in ACE. On the other hand, looking at the communication between the client and the resource server, where we have the re resource request response and the token transport, that is the scope of, of the work. That's the authentication and authorization of constrained devices. So, uh, yeah, basically, that's it. Next slide, please. Um, uh, 
well, maybe the, the, the question of the size of the boxes and so is probably uh, sort of more left to artists, but um, in some sense, for, for example, for um, OWASP people, um, the difference between the two could be explained as, if you look at the OWASP 2 specification, it provides a couple of different options, but then uh, OpenID Connect uh, with their different profiles sort of specifies in detail uh, on which profile you have to do certain things and they're actually in probability test suites and everything else uh, defined. That would be another way of uh, describing it. Okay, so, and here's um, the basic protocol flow, which is mapping uh, very closely to OAuth. You have the token request response, and uh, in the, the only difference being in the response, we, we use the term client information for what is not the access token in the response. So that's AB in this picture. Then we have the, the token transport and the request response, uh, resource request response, which may be interleaved by the introspection flow DE. And the, there may be variations of this flow depending on whether there is introspection or not, and also depending, as we mentioned previously, on the specific of the client resource server interactions, which is then detailed in, in the profile. So, for example, we could think of an, uh, a client resource server communicating using uh, co op and, uh, and the transport layer security or application layer security, or, or we could think of HTTP. Uh, and TLS, and the order of, and, and the way the token is transported could be different in these different cases. So the token could either come with a request, or before the request, or in the authentication handshake. So th these are the example of the variations that different profiles could, could show. Next slide, please. So that concludes the, the background. And now there are seven slides. I think there are seven slides about the different discussion topics at the interim meeting and some additional topics which we need to discuss today about nailing down what should be the scope for, for this draft. So one of the questions what was what deployment options should be included in this draft. We agreed to merge. In the current version, there is a uh, section six on deployment scenarios. And that section contains uh, a lot of, well, there are actually six different uh, scenarios. And we agreed to merge those examples with, uh, so that it's basically. Can show it on the screen. Okay. Give me a second. Just showing it on the screen, so guys, you, in case you don't have it in front of you. Here's the. Okay, so we have section six. Um, there's a number of different deployment scenarios, and the question was, which of these should we detail in this draft, and which should we leave for 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 later study? And the agreement was basically that we should merge um, those examples which deal with. Uh, local token verification, and those which deal with introspection. So, and, and we should leave out the group communication and tokenless uh, deployment option for, for later profiling. So, out of these six, the result is that there are two left. There is one, one message flow, uh, which is the, on the left left-hand side of the slide, the local verification of the token where there is no communication uh, online between RS and AS. And the other, uh, uh, the diagram on the right, which is the token introspection flow. And one of the questions was, should we keep the token introspection into this draft or should we separate it in, in, a, in a different draft? So, and, and I'm gonna make a proposal here so this is my personal proposal, and uh, the other authors and other people may, may comment on this. Um, my proposal 
is that I go through the different proposals, it's just seven slides, and then we have an open discussion. Otherwise, we might not reach the end of, of this presentation. So I'll try to quickly go through the different um, questions of the different proposed answers. Are there more proposals to this slide? So this, so this is slide number one with proposal one, one proposal. Okay, so you don't you want to go through all the uh, slides first and then have a discussion? Yes. Okay. I think that that could make sense because they are they are intertwined. This. So so if we flip them through now, we can go back and then uh, revisit the different proposals. So here the proposal is that we we, we keep introspection in this draft, and the reason is that. It's more or less the same information elements as being in, in both these flows, but they are uh, coming from through different interactions. And also, um, we need to have at least one of these because that, that's what this architecture is about. It's about transporting the authorization information and making the request. But if we only have one, we don't really illustrate the, um, the range of possible deployment scenarios. So I think we should keep at least these two. So we have shrink, shrunken now the, the set of deployment examples from six to two. And I think that we should not remove uh, the second one. Okay, next slide, please. The other question we had was around transportation. What kind of uh, security should be detailed in this document? Transport layer security or application layer security? And in the interim discussion, there was um, a lot of different views on this. Um, three votes were for both application layer and transport layer, but in different preferences of in which order they should be included in the document. Two votes were for only application layer security and one vote for only transport layer security within this document. So it's not a question whether we should support transport or application, because both should be supported. But the question is, what, which should be included in this draft? Does this, uh, which would be the sort of the, the base specification? And the proposal is that we include profiles defining one transport layer security solution, and one application layer security solution. That's your proposal. That's my. These are all my proposals. Yes. So, so you may disagree. And the transport layer security solution is DTLS. And as application layer security solution, we should make uh, select a COSI-based uh, solution. That's number two. Number three is credential options. So the question is here, which th there might be different type of credentials used by client and resource server to authenticate each other and establish a secure session and which should be detailed. And in the interim discussion, we agreed that no credentials are mandatory to implement, but at least uh, the raw public keys should be specified, the use of raw public keys. So the AS, and uh, well, so that's basically the question, which credentials should be specified? And there are some things to consider which we didn't discuss in the interim, and that's we need to um, define both the transport of the respective credential. So this is the, the credential that's used for the, by the client and, and resource server, and it's being transported from the AES to, to each of these nodes. And the second question is the binding of the, that credential to the access rights. And the proposal here is that we, we add to the, uh, raw public key, which was agreed, also the, the pre-shared key to what we define in this document. And the motivation is that pre-shared keys is favorable for constrained devices and is feasible in the trusted third-party setting. And the other part of the proposal is that we define the binding, not only to, to, to raw public keys and pre-shared keys, but to also to certificates. And then I, there's the next slide. So, uh, next slide, please. So the credential, uh, there is one sanity check, which we didn't do or haven't done so far in, uh, when it comes to uh, the credentials. And so I like, this is a new 
a new aspect which we haven't discussed before. That's why I have tried to highlight this slide with text, see if it, if it makes sense to read. So basically, we are looking at the first time the client and the resource server, um, the first time the client accessed the resource server. But we also need to consider more in detail what happens if a client accesses the same request with different rights or the same RS but with different resources. I mean, this is an obvious extension, but we don't want to repeat the credential provisioning and we want to maintain the binding of the credential to the access rights or ex an extension of the access rights. So the proposal here is, and this is not for decision today, it's just for information. It relates to the previous slide on, on the certificate uh, included in the bind, uh, binding of certificate to access rights. So the proposal is that we, the ACE framework should support a credential identifier replacing the actual credential. So there are two examples. So if a client has previously been authenticated with a raw public key, and it makes an additional request. Then in the token request, it doesn't have to include the, the raw public key. It, 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 it's sufficient to reference it. And similar, if the client previously has been authenticated with a certificate and it makes an additional token request, it should reference the certificate rather than authentic rather than um, uh, rather than uh, specify. Well, I mean, that, that's basically how it would, would, would specify what, um, which, for, for which, which client this access right is, is valid or should be valid. So that was the credential options. Slide, next slide. This is about token transport. There was a long discussion at the interim. How do we transport token in the different cases between client and resource server? And the general view is that, which I think also was sensed at the, at the meeting, is that um, there are drawbacks and advantages of the different options. And the only solution that works in all cases seems to be the one that we do have this defined uh, resource server endpoint authorization info. So that's the proposal defined only post to authorization info in the ACE framework, but allow profiles to define alternatives in separate drafts. For example, using um, PSK identity in DTLS or, or something else. Slide four, sorry, number case number four, now number five, next slide. Thank you. We had a discussion of synchronized time. And the problem there is that we need to support certain cases where constrained devices have no synchronized clock. So we need some additional mechanism. And then one example of a non-spaced freshness was presented in the interim and got support. And there's also been a discussion on authenticated key, key exchange in the mailing list. So the proposal is that we actually use time in general for resource server, but when we, the resource server cannot use time, absolute time, we should use a nonce-based mechanism to align the time or the way of measuring time in the RS and the AS. So it's not really a nonce-based protocol, but it's a nonce, uh, it's a way of using a nonce passed from the RS to the AS and signed back to the RS in, in, a, in a way that the RS could get in timely information about uh, or information about the current, current time or current state. So okay, there, there's been a long discussion on the mailing list on, on what, what aspect of time that needs to be, um, be included, uh, since it's not necessarily a uh, an, uh, sort of wall clock time. It could be more like a sequence of events that, or uh, an ordered sequence of, of events. Okay, so that's, that's number five. Number six was the question about co-op versus HTTP. Should we specify the solution in terms of co-op or HTTP or both? And the interim discussion gave three votes for co-op only 
two votes for both. And this is one of the examples where the authors are very divided, and uh, I'm one of the authors. I have a, I'm clearly partial here, and I propose that there's no disagreement that the co-op framework should support the use of co-op or and HTTP. But uh, I propose then that the co-op profile should be included in this draft, but that we wait with the HTTP for a separate draft to manage the complexity of things. And finally, slide seven is the discussion on Seaborg versus Jason or Cosi versus Jose. And again, here the authors are very divided. There were, uh, and, and also other who chime in here, make that they, uh, th the votes were equally distributed. So um, three votes for only specifying this protocol in terms of Cosi Seaborg. Um, in this document and then allowing extensions later and three votes for for both specifying the protocol in terms of Cbor and, and JSON. And my proposal here is that the ACE framework should support the use oh, sorry again that obviously the, the framework should support the use of both but we should only include Cbor, COSI um, from the start. And the motivation is that there are not only the Cbor web token includes Cbor, uh, but also other client information. So it would be um, it would mean that certain um, claims, for example, would would have a Cbor or a JSON encoding, which I think is uh, unnecessary. Right. I think I've, I've said everything. Yeah, okay, the final point here. So to the extent that the COT, the Cbor web token and the JOT are exchangeable without changing this draft, I think that both should be referenced. But in the other instances where Cbor or JSON may be used, I think we should stick to only specifying uh, Cbor. And that is the final slide. So I would like you to recap or get back to slide one and then start a discussion on deployment options. Uh, Dave Taylor, can you go to slide three? And while you're doing that, I just want to go back to, uh, without flipping back to the slide, um, you started off um, by saying, which I think is fine, <coughs> that there would be a uh, ACE framework when then there's different ACE profiles. And uh, the different ACE profiles did not have to be interoperable between each other, just it was an interoperability profile. Okay. So that is the context. Um, uh, I wanted to concentrate on the phrase, uh, no credentials are mandatory to implement. And so um, I think any time that you just say something, nothing is mandatory to implement, that says that nothing is interoperable because what you end up with is vendor-specific silos. Mm -hmm. And so for each of these things, we have multiple choices, including credentials. I think that uh, you really should have something that's mandatory to implement per ACE profile. And that if you say within an ACE profile, nothing is mandatory implement, then there's no point in having a standard because yeah. you won't get any interoperability. Good point. That was for the frame. This was intended for the framework. Right. On the other ones, you sort of made it clear that, oh, at the framework level, there's multiple choices, you know, uh, you know, CBOR versus JSON or whatever else. But on a per profile basis, you were going to pick one. This one, it didn't say that. And I went yeah, back to yeah. the minutes of the interim, and it actually doesn't even talk about this. And so yeah. if we can say that within an ACE profile, there is always a mandatory implement for every single one of these choices so that you can guarantee interoperability, then uh, that would be uh, preferable. Thanks. Yeah. That makes total sense to me. So, um, so wake up. Uh, good time to uh, now start because that's sort of the main part of the meeting, and uh, we need to make the, uh, or have some informed discussions about uh, these different issues. And obviously, we would like to walk out of the room with a good sense of what we should do. You see, as, as Gern uh, correctly mentioned at the beginning, all the different issues are sort of a little bit related to each other. And um, sort of working them out would be great. So I think for each of these issues where there's multiple choices or whatever, um, I gather that the answer can be different on a per ACE profile basis. And so how many ACE profiles are we actually talking about here? Is there just two or is there more than two or whatever? And then for each of these questions, you have to answer it on a per ACE profile basis, right? And so let's say, here's the official list of ACE profiles. And then for each of those, which is the right choice out of these different choice, choices, right? Dave Taylor. 
they, they were, I said it when I got it before, but yeah. Okay, but uh, maybe I so, should, I should also. Say. Sure. So I just want to comment on Dave. And that's, I mean, we had sort of six deployment options from the start. And, and now we've merged a couple and we added a couple. So we don't have the full range of profiles. So that's, that's a good, a good uh, question. Yeah. Is a deployment option one to one with an ACE profile? Um, as, as I'm using it, yes. That's, we used to call it the, in, the, in the previous version, it's called deployment scenario. And now we are shifting to profile. So I think that's, that would be a yes on that answer. Yes. So um, this is Hannes. Uh, at the beginning of the of the meeting, I may, I talked about the the milestones and so on, and also uh, currently we have as a milestone for this document to finish it in May. And as you see, like there are lots of different options, and if we have the ambition to also uh, write some code before we feel confident enough to ship the document, that's obviously like quite realistically. Uh, that means that we have to ax down a couple of options and move them to then separate documents which then can be worked on potentially by different authors who are specifically interested in some of these other uh, um, use cases, deployment options, profiles, whatever you want to call them, and who are then interested to also look at some of the implementation work and so on. And if I look at uh, all the work that has been done, for example, in OpenID Connect, not only with specifying these different um, profiles, but also with doing the interoperability testing and, and specifically the surf certification program, that's obviously a lot of work. Uh, so, um, going, um, so I have an opinion about uh, what should go into uh, this version of the document versus what should be separate. And, and I think the uh, discussion on the mailing list as well as the intra meeting informed that a little bit. So um, I, I think it would make sense to go for a, sm for a minimum amount of uh, stuff in this, in this version of the document and then have other uh, separate documents on the side. And one possibility uh, for me would be specifically on the uh, slide number two, we talked about uh, transport layer security versus uh, application layer security. There, I personally would go for only covering transport layer security in the in that document to make a forward reference to uh, ongoing work that um, talks about application layer security mostly because I'm I'm worried about the uh, uh, dependency to a solution which uh, is still not yet uh, adopted anywhere like we have these discussions on on what I call uh, uh, co-op signing uh, which and uses the, the stuff that you have been working on, but it's it still has to be adopted in the uh, in the core working group. It has to be finalized. It would probably it could easily push us back a year, uh, quite realistically, if we have a normative reference on that on that solution. Um, so that's that's my preference for for this one. Uh, if you because the transport layer security solution is something that we we can use already. Okay, on the slide number three on the credential type. I also, uh, we have the co-op document specifies three different credential types, um, and namely uh, raw public keys, PSKs, and uh, certificates. And I'm less and less convinced uh, that the certificates make sense for most of the use cases in an IoT uh, environment. The, but I would push the PSK-based mechanism into a separate document because uh, from the experience in the OWASP working group on on the proof of possession key, those they turn out to be more complicated than than one would think. Um, for the and, and those the complications relate to the way how the tokens are presented. Carsten has a uh, with Steffi has a solution on how present how to integrate that into transport layer security. The story is different for uh, the raw public key is different for the certificate. So it's uh, the whole stuff needs to be worked out um, in, in way more detail. It sounds like uh, easy to integrate, but it's, I don't think it actually is. Um, the uh, reason why I... That was me. Okay. On that point, could, could you write to the mailing list and explain a little bit exactly what the problem is? I mean, you're referring to experiences and all. Yeah, so, yeah I, can, I, I can also um, say that. So 
the um, the issue is with the breach of secrets like from a from a security point of view you obviously you have to have uh, the, the secret is shared between the AES and the C uh, the the client uh, that's the first thing which obviously like with a raw public key solution you don't you don't need to have that uh, which is a big plus uh, so the IoT device can generate a key pair locally and only export the public key or a hash of a public key to the AES and to other parties uh, and so so that provides a lot more uh, security than than a shared secret based uh, variant when you say IoT device did you mean client or resource server the in this case I'm talking about uh, the client here, um, the resource server uh, will have to do the same as one. Okay, but the, the AS and the resource server are supposed to be tightly connected in the sense of the AS is uh, still. But I'm I'm still finding. worried about uh, compromises of AS uh, that leak those uh, shared secrets. I'm still worried about that case. Yeah, it is a, uh, it is a trusted third party. It's a trusted third party from the perspective of the client and the resource server, but. Uh, uh, not from an adversary point of view. Okay. Um, so like with database breaches, uh, those are also uh, like they are trusted from, from the user's point of view because they share a secret, but still database breaches happen all the time and I assume it will happen here as well. It's also a liability for those deploying the AES to actually make sure that those are kept secret. Um, so that's why I, 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 I understand that the performance differences and all sort of trade-offs, but um, Ideally, we would like to go for the uh, for public key based version. Um, there's also um, there's also unfortunately there's a collision in the agenda for this meeting. The token binding working group is working at the same time as uh, as we meet here. Um, they are actually looking at using um, pretty much a raw public key based solution for the web browsers and tying them to them to cookies and also to OWASP access tokens, uh, and so we could potentially leverage some of the work, and which is, if you go one slide forward, it actually provides another benefit uh, of doing, following that approach. Sorry, Hannes, maybe we should say in, in respect to those not here, that there are, some of the authors are arguing for certificates because they, they would like to see the IoT as a sort of a continuum starting with Powerful devices moving down to constrained devices, and certificates are present. Yeah. The power. Um, so and and a, um, that's the reason why staying. Yeah, on it's the just um, it's just a preference for what goes into the document. I I I understand also these arguments for integration with existing infrastructure, same tool set, same infra, uh, same <laughs> sort of providers, and so on. That makes a lot of sense. But uh, um, yeah. And then um, if you go one, or, are you on this slide or on? Two, two quick comments. <clears throat> Obviously, I'm interested in this uh, PSK uh, case, and uh, I actually don't really care whether it's done in this document or in a separate document, but I think it should be high end on our list of uh, priorities. And uh, looking at this continuum, um, when you go from RPK to the certificate space, there are actually several dimensions to certificates that, that you can have or not have. Uh, separately. One is uh, having the certificate anchored in the existing web PKI, which changes a lot of, of the, the underlying assumptions. So when people say certificates, they often mean web PKI based certificates. The second question is, are these certificates that are expressed in X, uh, X509 form? Because that brings a lot of baggage. Uh, parts of X509 are, are not as well defined. Uh, as one would uh, like them to be. So that, that, that is another question that uh, has to be asked. And the certificate may be just an RPK with a little bit more information in, in the simplest case. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Karsten. I think that's a very good point. Uh, so when I talk about the raw public keys, what I, what I mean is, uh, in this context, is uh, the IoT device, the client generates the um, public-private key pair, uh, and then sends the public key to the AES, which includes it in the um, either JSON web token or the SIBO web token that we're going to hear about later. And in some sense, that may look like, uh, with all the different claims in it, may actually look like a certificate uh, to a certain extent, uh, but just with a different encoding and, and also in 
with respect to the to the web BKI, I, I um, at least the, the guys we talk to that talk about certificate, they are talking literally about the form reusing the format X five four nine certificates and uh, the existing sort of uh, server side infrastructure, etc. But they are not talking about, uh, or at least nobody I have been talking to in this group has meant that to reuse the web BKI model. I think that would be pretty crazy. Uh, well, if, uh, if you go to, to the, uh, this, this is not the right slide. So yeah, and, and here's another one, and it relates to slide five as well, the token transport and the, and the protocol uh, being used to do that token transport. Um, like HTTP and co-op as you have on the other slide. Um, the, specifically when you use uh, the token binding, it actually provides, uh, it provides a nice integration into the higher layer protocols. So for example, you can use token binding with co-op, uh, with HTTP without actually having to uh, modify these uh, different protocols. At least that's my understanding of how token binding works. Um, so I, I think that's um, that's another possibility. In addition to, uh, we had various different options for the token transport. One was in transport layer security, uh, additional data, et cetera, et cetera, ticket format, et, and so on. So I think um, at least at, at the moment, that's my my preference. Um, I, not, I noticed that we have encountered various problems with each of the proposals who looked great first, but then they're not supported in TLS 1.3, and they have some other uh, shortcomings or violate some other requirements in the in the respective RFCs. So, so that's in summary my a long okay. summary. But thanks. Any other views? Should we flip through them and see if there are any comments on each of the? Yeah, I wonder, um, Carsten, do you, do you have any preferences on some of them? You uh, Or do you just wait till we sort of get a sense from the room? Or Because I think we need more discussions on the, these items. Uh, I feel that, I, I, I don't know if people fully, some of you have participated in a virtual wow. intra meeting, so I'm, I'm sure you're aware of it, or you may have looked at the discussions we had separately on the, on afterwards on the mailing list, but, but I think we, that's an important decision to make. Right. So I, I, I didn't really say very much about this because it should be obvious that, that uh, I would like to have all the parts in place to, so we can do a DKF-like solution. Um, say that again? I would like to have all the parts in place so we can do a DKF-like solution. I mean, w without the client-side manager, but at least all the other parts should be in place. Uh, so uh, we, we would need uh, PSK, we, we not uh, would need all the other parts that are needed uh, to, to make that happen. Uh, so I think it should be pretty obvious what, what, what uh, I need here. Well, um, but you, you can get that, uh, for example, on the BSK versus, uh, for example, raw public key or certificates. I think you could get there even in a, uh, by a separate document, not necessarily having the BSK described in this document. Yes, and as yeah. I said, I'm, I'm pretty open to the the uh, division of things into yeah. documents, but um, uh, it, it probably makes a lot of sense to actually go ahead and have different documents that operate on on some slightly decoupled timelines here. So if we decide to sit, say uh, we put PSK into one document and actually get the, get the expertise of people who know how to do this do this PSK uh, stuff to to work on the document, uh, that would be fine. Yeah, but I think the area where we can't have uh, um, sort of like, in, in some areas, these different options make a lot of sense because there are different deployment benefits and, and so on. But for example, when it comes to the token transport, I don't think it makes sense to exhaustively describe all different ways you can present tokens. All of them uh, like would then have six different options. I think that will not help a lot with uh, interoperability. Would you agree to that? Yeah, the, the, well, this is again a framework versus profile question. So the, the, the framework may actually need to be wide enough to, uh, to uh, encompass a number of, of the ways, and a specific profile may select. But, I'm the, 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 okay, Dave. Uh, Dave Sammer. 
um, I guess a lot of the things that you're going through right here, you're saying, well, there's multiple different options, and some of them might be coming later, and uh, not everybody can necessarily agree on one thing for all possible profiles. And so um, I guess my recommendation would be to split the document such that the document itself, that this document only covers the framework and covers zero profiles and have a separate document per profile. Okay. Because that way, the thing that you're forced to claim interoperability to is not the framework. You're forced to claim interoperability to a particular profile, and you get a single RFC number out of that. And so my, my earlier question asked you, how many profiles do you expect there to be? And you said two. And that seems a bit optimistic if you say, well, some of those options might not come for a year or so. Um, and so people are going to do something in the meantime. And so having uh, two uh, is uh, probably a bit uh, on the low end in my mind, especially if you have new options coming forward. Um, but still, that's fine. I would still do the same thing. I would still say that there's a framework RFC that's not one that you claim compliance to when doing an implementation or deployment. And then there's, an, there's two or more profile documents, some of which may be done now, some of which might not be done for a year or more. Um, maybe only one is done now, maybe two is done now, whatever it is. And either they evolve or you add a third one later or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but that means the thing that you actually claim, claim compliance to is not this document, it's a profile document. And some of the things that are in here could move into the profile document and be done now too. But I think that gives a stronger uh, likelihood of interoperability because now you're pointing to a single, everybody that says I claim, uh, I conform to RFC number, whatever it is, all of them is exactly the same profile. Yeah, and Dave, wait, um, so, for example, picking, to better understand what you mean, uh, picking, for example, this item that we have on a slide, what you would describe then in, in sort of the framework mm -hmm. document is you would basically discuss uh, that sort of the need uh, for this token transport outline on what the requirements are, but you wouldn't define any of the specific mechanisms, but push them like from a, from a uh, sort of RC25519 language point of view, push them to a profile. Is that correct? Uh, so I could imagine either of two approaches done in the framework, and I do not have a strong preference between them, right? Mm -hmm. So one type of ways that people do profiles is they specify a bunch of options in the main document. And a profile just says it's option A from the first list, and option B from the second list, and option C from the third list. And so in that sense, the profile document, when people do that, doesn't contain significant new mechanisms. It just references a set of specific options and how they kind of fit together and so on. And another way that people do profiles is they leave it underspecified in the framework one and put all the uh, uh, details in the profile one. I don't have any strong preference between those two. Okay. Um, if you think that there's going to be multiple profiles that pick, say, to the same option, then there's a little bit of advantage of putting it into the framework so that they don't have to specify the same thing twice uh, because both profiles happen to chose the same option. Um, but I don't know, I have a strong preference between either of those two. So I was not, not trying to argue for or against that. Mm. Um, I think that's a fine question that the working group can decide, and I don't have an opinion. So coming to that, <clears throat> so the the design idea behind behind the way it was proposed here is that there um, this token transport could be supported in, in all cases. That was yeah, basically I was mostly commenting on the other options where there's two clear alternatives. You know, for example, the the JSON versus CBOR or the you know HTTP versus CoAP and things. And there's sort of well-defined choices to make there. It's not an arbitrarily extensible list that, that you'd expect profiles to be picking between. Um, the one you have on the screen might be slightly more hand-wavy than that. Sure. So that's why I don't have any opinion yeah. on this one. Okay. I was primarily mm -hmm. concentrating on all of your other slides that had, Good. well, here's a list of stuff, right? Right. Is okay. it, uh, PSK or is it raw public key or is it certificate? Is it JSON or C yeah. or is it yeah? And just another add to that, um, the other design objective was that it should be one of the authors wanted this to be compliance to to an RFC that actually was something um, except uh, a framework which is doesn't really say anything about what. But but that's uh, that's the reason why it looks like I, I'm not objecting to what you propose. I'm just saying that the reason why it looks like it does. Yeah. So I don't care whether anybody claims to be compliant to the framework, that concept is meaningless to me. Yes. Being compliant to a profile is what's meaningful. So. Yep. Hi, Renzo Navas. I wanted to discuss slide number five about the proof of possession token. I sent a few weeks ago some um, uh, slides about other proof of possession token binding using authenticated key establishment. I just wanted to point out that uh, if we should um, go through different proposals and if it's ACE or how the working group, we should uh, um, implement these uh, proposals. Um, 
basically, I wanted to start the discussion. Do we agree we need a non space uh, proof of possession uh, uh, token mechanism? If it's yes, the answer, I think it is. Uh, is this ACE the, the working group to work together with uh, OAuth? Where do we put the profile? Uh, um, so basically, I want to raise the question. Um, yeah, I think there's several, several questions that you raised. Uh, and obviously, as uh, since Gern put this up there, it's, uh, it's an item that we need to make a decision on. Uh, one, one decision is um, whether, we, whether we have um, what assumptions we make in okay so referring back to the start differently referring back to the discussion we just had and the comment that Dave gave about this framework versus profile um, uh, I think it's fair to say that we want to discuss this topic in a framework document that the fact that uh, uh, there may be time soon our lack of time, time synchronization and there are problems associated with that and pr there may be profiles who need to uh, specify some of that behavior and the corresponding solution. And so the question there is, um, do we want that um, function, that content to be included in the main document, uh, in the framework document, or uh, in a separate profile? And if there's a profile, who, who would be interested to work on it? Or is there in general in a group interesting interest enough to work on it? Is, is that now? Uh, so does that, is that meaningful, guess? So my proposal was that this should be a separate document that that looked at the case when we have local token verification and not and not and still using time or some some sense of time but using the, the nonce to update the time that, that was my proposal so um and, and that would be a separate document as i see it not if if we look if we agree that the time is some some sort of sense of time is how we we will uh, look at validity and freshness. Then we uh, we use this as a complement to to update time. Yes, I, I, in in most uh, authenticated key uh, establishment solutions, actually you need the three parties to be online more or less. So I think that totally breaks out like uh, as we are used to see either. Uh, client talks to authorization server and later yeah. talks to resource server. Uh, for instance, in one client talks to RS sends the nonce, RS sends also the nonce to authorization server, and authorization server send the token to both. So, yes. So basically, with respect to the slides you sent, uh, I think that it, it's probably only Otway Reese or one of those protocols that that okay. would work in this uh, so context. I, I propose to discuss which one of these authenticating key elements is of interest to profile we know out. And I I get gladly write a profile or, or I, we can see or implement also, I don't know. Yeah, that would, that would be great. I don't know if you've, you said that you posted the uh, um, slides uh, to the list. I, I uh, Sorry, I didn't notice them. Maybe uh, we can look at the slides uh, on this topic. I think we... I can resend the email uh, forward or send yeah. again the slides. Just send it to me. Okay. Uh, to discuss this, uh, because it's obviously one of the trickier issue. Uh, so we, in the discussions, um, I think we found out that there's we should make a differentiation between literally synchronized clocks um, so that there's that we can uh, compare, like for example, an expiry date and time uh, with the information that is available to an I IoT device. Uh, that's compare that or differentiate that case from one where there's uh, a real-time clock on the device, and but it's not synchronized to some global time. So, so it has only some some lo no, uh, local notion of time, and I think. Those two cases are, are useful to differentiate, but um, we can we can come to you. Or if you send me the slides, I can then um, uh, put them up on the screen and we uh, talk through them. Is there anyone in Java? By the way, did, is someone attending the Java chat?
Yeah, can can please someone join the chat room, chat room, please? Are you? Okay, Carsten. Yeah, just wanted to to say something again that I think Jan already said. Um, that there is something like wall clock time or real time, and there are also various concepts of virtual time. So when you use something like Lampard uh, timestamps or vector clocks. That does give you some some uh, indication of fresh, freshness that is based on a sequence of events, and that may be more appropriate for some kinds uh, of of devices. And it's actually possible to combine both. So if you have a, only a rough uh, idea of elapsed time, you can co combine that with uh, something like Lampard timestamps to to get a pretty reasonable kind of freshness. <coughs> Yeah, okay, tonight. Uh, Mohit, so I have a general comment on this, and I think this is a problem with IoT. There are so many different types of devices that have different constraints and so many use cases uh, that it's difficult to make everyone happy. So maybe the way forward would be to start with one profile and like have an implementation for that profile, get some experiences from that, and then get it as an RFC instead of working on this framework where there is like so many possible options and, and it's difficult to keep everyone happy. So I don't know how many people have the motivation to do the different profiles, but uh, maybe pick one or two use cases in which the authors are interested and get that out first and have some experiences from that instead of like uh, discussing this on and on forever. So would, uh, do you have some preferences? Oh, uh, RPK. I, I I have preferences for some of of the seven options, but okay. uh, I don't know if the authors are motivated enough to write the profiles for them. Yeah. So but we'd be interested to hear your your preferences. So please send them to the mailing list if you don't want to state them now. I I'm rather suggesting whatever you like, do okay. that. Right. As, as a start, get that profile working, have an implementation rather than yeah. making everyone happy. Just to reply on this framework aspect. The purpose of the framework is just to say, what part of OAuth do we need to change and how? So that, that's the reason that, that, and that should be a common denominator. And you could do that as, as you propose, Mohit, that we, we first take one profile and see that this profile requires these type of changes to, to OAuth, or these type of profiling of OAuth. And then we do the same with the, with the second profile. Or we could do things in parallel. So that's, but the framework is essentially the OAuth profile, so it's, it's nothing more heavyweight than that. Uh, the framework document should not be a barrier for others to progress on the profiles. I think the profile should you know, we should have code up and running for the profile, some experience from that, and then maybe we can decide what fits in the, in the framework document rather than the other way around. Okay. Okay. I'm a suggest who is in Jabber, so I don't know if somebody else is Jabber scribing, but uh, two comments from Jabber that I don't know that the people here in the room, or if they are, I didn't see them. Uh, Robert Craigie said plus one, re-splitting the document into framework plus additional profile documents. Michael Richardson said plus five on virtual time. Um, um, and if there's blue sheets going around, I don't think this side of the room has seen them yet. Okay. So where's the blue sheet? Could you, who hasn't signed the blue sheet yet? Oh my God, okay. Okay, so I I think that's the proposal here are very very sound and the, the idea of not trying to to please everyone is a, is a good uh, it's a good proposal. So and I think that uh, the fact that we are uh, we are represented in the in the team of authors with quite diverse opinions would be uh, a good way to ensure that there are multiple profiles or with which will have the same uh, denominator. Any more comments? Um, 
should we go through these options and see if we have reached anything uh, or if we are still at the we'll same page? That, um, but um, uh, first, we briefly talk a little bit more about this. About the, could we talk about the timestamp stuff? Yeah. So uh, I see proof of procession Maybe token, the, the you aim. Want to come over here? Ah. So with the proof of possession token, we can have a, pre a, a, a symmetric tree associated to the token. So there are, there's already authenticated key establishment methods that aim to achieve that. So basically, I took the nonce base. Can we go to slide number two? So these are well-known authenticated key establishment methods using a trusted party and that uses nonce. So my aim was to avoid the use of timestamps. So as we see, um, first one maps to what we have in OAuth, and the other three are not so similar. But um, so I, these are all the options I, I see, I saw that are viable. And I map it to a REST, uh, to a REST um, like uh, options can we pass to it well the first one doesn't totally map to ours because that would be ours with token introspection with the first communication between the a and, and the, the party a to the trusted third party missing yes or no because party a can be the client for the resource server if we go to next slide the the party a is the one to send the first message okay but imagine if the client opens the communication and is the resource server directly with the with the nonce the resource server will be uh, so when we map this uh, authenticated key statements to a rest scenario we can make map um, the party num uh, called a to either the client or the resource servers that give us some flexibility and if we assume the resource server doesn't have connectivity with the, with the authorization server. The only the first top left solution that can be used to 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 generate a authenticated key. Authenticated key. Um, so in this in this slide, I only focus on the flow of message to to analyze which one are viable, and we can probably uh, adapt to a proof position talk. Can we? Pass to next slide. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so what I, I what I what I don't get from the slides uh, so far is, so you, it, you have the authentication and you guarantee the freshness using nonces, um, and and that's great. Um, but uh, one of the other problems that um, we had with with the use of uh, um, absolute time in in various protocols, for example, certificate with the expiry time and so on was that they indicated on how long the authorization decision was valid. And I'm curious on how that's actually done uh, without having time, uh, sort of like, with, um, so you could, you could still say it in a, in a relative time, it's like this, is, this authorization decision is valid for five seconds uh, in a token rather than what we did today, we encoded it, this is valid uh, till. Um, and so how does this, solve that problem <laughs> this solution well you have key confirmation so you know both party has a new fresh key yep and if we have a relative time we can say this key is valid for a few seconds but, but we but, will never have absolute time we cannot but why why would you need any of those in the first place because if we um sort of if we, for example, let's say we use a, a JWT, um, CWT-based mechanism, and instead of having an expiry time and a start time, we just replace that with, uh, let's say, validity for so many seconds or so. And the, all the other protocols, like the stuff that we use underneath, um, already uses a, a, a sort of a non-space scheme, uh, DTLS, for example, or TLS and DTLS, 
doesn't rely on, on timestamps when you, for example, use raw public keys or PSKs. But you assume you are, we already have the PSK on both sides, these mechanisms? And no, 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 well, you have, you have the, uh, even with those mechanisms, you have the key on both sides. No, only with the trusted party. No, no, of course. Uh, so in, in, for, for the stuff we talk about, the proof possession key mechanism, what you have is you have uh, the key shared between uh, the client, the trusted third party, and the trusted third party and uh, the resource server. So it is, it's the same assumption, underlying assumption. But uh, in the current proof of possession token, you need um, the, the resource server needs uh, have no, to have notion of absolute time, I think. It, it only, checks the freshness with, with the time. Right. I'm, I'm, so that's why I'm, I'm proposing to, instead of uh, including the a time stamp in there as, as to indicate on how long the token is valid till a certain uh, time. I, I am wondering, uh, or I suggest to investigate whether it would be sufficient to just say this is valid for 10 seconds. But of course, that would assume that uh, the, re the resource server has a real time clock. With this, you don't need any time, but we can add the, for the duration purpose, we can add, but. Um, some of these algorithms are 30 years old. It's, um, there already exist uh, several solutions that use timestamps or non-space. So if we don't want to use timestamp, we should use some non-space solution. I, I don't think so. Uh, I, I don't know if you, what you guys think uh, about this, whether any one of you has thought this through, but um, yeah, go ahead. Um, we had a discussion at the interim meeting. I sent you a slide. If you could put that up, please. Sure. Sorry. We are reinventing the wheel if we want to define a new mechanism non-space. Why don't we look up uh, the ones that already exist and adapt it to? So this was one of the discussions we had. That this is not, not a, a fully non-spaced uh, authentication protocol, but it's, it's a way of using a nonce to using a nonce to to set the clock at the at the resource server to align the time. And it's basically, I mean, it's not setting the clock in the set of absolute time because we, we may not have absolute time. But it's it's setting that it's sort of synchronizing that we are now at this event, the resource server, and it's it's basically it's a very simple flow that the, the resource server um, it's rejecting a. a re, a resource request and it includes a nonce, and then the client is, is supposed to get to the or go to the authorization server and, and request a new uh, token. And with the token, it gets back signed nonce. So then it, it, you could provide information about about the state or, or the time. I mean, yeah. but the problem with that scenario was that uh, the token be essentially becomes a one-time token. Well, it, it becomes a set. You now know that. You now know what time the authorization server, I mean, you know the time lapse between the, when you sent the, the, the nonce and you received the nonce, or you know which event it corresponds to. And the resource server needs to keep uh, information, uh, store information about the nonces. I mean, this could be sequence numbers or it could be something else. It still has to store them, the highest sequence number. Yes, yes, sure. This is, this is an additional mechanism, but it's, it's a way of handling the situation that the RS, I mean, in the case when we have introspection or we have connectivity, that the RS could, could sync time somehow. That, that's, then, then everything is well. But the, the specific assumption here is that we don't have that case. We, we cannot assume that the RS is connecting directly to the AS or to a time server. So this must be one way of, so of getting what I, information. What I'm trying to push you guys is to state what the assumptions are, their trade-offs uh, with all these solutions. And you, I don't see the trade-offs being stated. And the trade-off here that is, would be important. this is not, a, I mean, this, the trade-off is that you need to keep a nonce. Yes, you need to keep a sequence number, but, but what you're gaining here is that you're gaining, you could still have a, a fully or time-based mechanism at the RS. But this is a way of synchronizing the time. It's it's still it's not it's not in any way giving up time, but it's just making a um, a way of syncing the time with the RS and the AS. That's what the nonce gives you. I, I don't think that sort of it would require more text to actually fully understand okay. this.
Where did you get it? Where did you got it from? Um, I, I made this up myself, but okay. there, there are other things as well in similar. But this flow of message maps to already existing authenticated key establishment solution. This is Otway Reese in one of the one of the uh, versions that uh, Renzo put yeah. up. My, my, my only objection or my only sort of concern that I raise is that these exchanges, these are key exchanges and they provide, they don't talk about the authorization. That's their weakness. Uh, they, and that's where one part on the freshness comes in at the authenticate, authenticated key exchange, but the other part of the freshness comes via and the lifetime becomes, get, is associated with the authorization. We need to solve both problems because we are the authentication and authorization for constraint environment uh, working group, not just the authentication for constraint environment working group. I mean, the, the point here is just, how does the RS know that the token coming is is fresh? Of course. Um, and, and here we have, we have uh, fresh, I mean, one, it's one that the, yeah, the token needs to be fresh and, and of course the exchange needs to be fresh. Yes, and the, I mean, this is a way of, of, of for the RS to get an indication that this, Token actually comes from the AS now. Yeah, got it. I have Stefan Santos on AAA security. Um, I have a question which is quite possibly very stupid, but I have to ask it. Uh, why do you even have to synchronize the time of the RS? Why can't you just ask RS for its relative notion of time and issue every token to that RS in the RS relative time? context instead of trying to synchronize the time of RS just ask it what is your view of the time and then send tokens to the RS in that view of the the, the local view of RS time I, can, I have an example yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is Dave Robin I can actually answer that question coincidentally um, because in in one of the primary use cases I have the client is uh, the RS and the AS can't see each other. That's one we've we've established that you know because I'm commissioning a building, I'm bringing something up, um, but the client actually at the moment also can't talk to the authorization server. So our scenario is that the client goes to the authorization server somehow, walks to the machine room, clicks in, whatever, gets on the internet, establishes something, gets a token that's good for a day, then he goes to the air handler or whatever he's commissioning and says, "Here's my token." And the air handler says, oh, good, that, I see that that's valid because well, here's, he knows, needs no time. He says, your, your, your token is valid. So there's no introspection and there's no opportunity at that moment for the client to get the local time of the RS and give it to the AS and get something back, right? Because, I mean, that would work great. He says, you're expired. The expiration, the OAuth expiration could be in terms of the RS's local time. That would work too. But... So that's one scenario that, that fails that. Um, but the reason I came to the mic is because, uh, say, replacing expiration with duration doesn't work because of replay, because it's valid for 10 seconds. It's always valid for 10 seconds every time I give you this token. So you would have to then say, oh, wait, I've seen that token. I have context for it. I'm remembering it. I only do the duration the first time, and after that I'm counting, you know, something like that. But then eventually you have a, a context expiration attack where you just simply you go away and you wait for all kinds of other activity to come in. His, his little re, most recently used uh, token cache expires. You come back and replay that token. So you always have, with these really constrained devices that can't remember every token they've ever seen, you have to account for the fact that I'm replaying a really old token. And that's where the expiration time just works. So I, I don't know, really know an alternative to it. Hmm. Sequence numbers are difficult too because you have to have a sequence number for every client that you're talking to. Same thing, so, and, but. And then you may have constraints on uh, what you want to store as well. So, uh, yeah, so the, the tricky problems. It is, yeah. yes. I, but I think that replay problems can be solved by other means because with proof of position token, you have a key that you only share with, uh, with the other party. So if anyone, you cannot, you don't, you don't have actually the key to encrypt the token. When you encrypt your request, you are using the, the key that is binded to that token. So you only have the key, so nobody can actually make uh, um, as if you just replay a message with the same sequence number, the other party will reject it. You cannot make new message with the token. 
yes, you're you're proving that you possess you as a client are proving you possess something that me as an RS have no clue about. So it it doesn't really I there's no relationship between the RS and the C. And the RS at this moment can't talk to the AS and the C can't talk to the AS. So that's why these completely offline signed tokens work well in that scenario. You the C gets a signed token from the AS, presents it to the RS, the RS verifies the signature and knows that it came from the AS and knows that it's still valid based on time. And it works well for uh, the other scenario is you eliminated earlier talked eliminated group. Group's very important to us. So it, the proof of possession doesn't work. Hey, who are you? I don't know. It, you know, it's going to a group. It's that's where really just having the token signed by the AS and not expired is sufficient for for the models that I'm working with. So, so I think um, I think it's clear that we need to do a little bit more homework here. Uh, but um, and presumably you you want to and you want to participate in that work. But I'm going to ask later on when I go through the individual items that uh, Gerhard presented on who is actually interested to uh, participate in some exercise to produce, uh, write, up, write up some text that uh, can be then sort of considered as part of a profile. Okay. Is that okay? Cool. Yeah. I also did a little bit of homework based on the discussions there. And what I did was um, I looked at some processes uh, and just as a, as a data point and because I, it would be nice if uh, someone could then also implement this stuff and figure out what it really works. And and it turns out that um, at least the processes I have seen, they all contain a real-time clock built in. And not only one, for example, here I have one from a company called SD Microelectronics. It's the low power uh, stuff. And it has a couple of different sleep uh, modes. And I can send you the slides. I don't. It's not, it's a, a workshop uh, on low power. And each of those modes has different, you turn off different parts of the silicon. And you even turn off different parts of the clock since it has six clocks, that specific series, in that case, you can turn off things and it still then wakes up. Of course, if you remove the battery altogether, then, then, then it stops obviously. But uh, so you can still, if you want to keep, uh, sort of low power clocks running even with the slowest with the lowest sleep states which in this case is the standby mode where pretty much uh everything is turned up off and and it would be would be interesting to see as part of that exercise whether then there is any meaningful result coming out of the um the work then afterwards and uh interestingly enough that slides uh also explain 137 that there's a, obviously a significant difference in power consumption when you when you use this lift different sleep states and different clocks are running or or not running or the other parts peripherals are turned off so uh insightful uh beyond sort of the topic of real-time clocks we'll send that to the list and absolutely upload the slides that uh were previously presented good uh going back to Guerin's uh, talk. So what I'm, so I would like to get a little bit um, your feedback. And uh, specifically, the first question is, uh, is really what Dave had suggested um, to separate out a framework description from uh, the profile description. I think that would be an important uh, direction for further work in a group. And um, so just to try to phrase the question correctly, so Dave um, suggested to have uh, a document that describes the framework um, and then independently separate documents that describe different profiles. Um, and if you implement something, you can then implement the profile and claim conformance to a profile, but you can't complain conformance to the framework, which is sort of like more architectural nature. Uh, so if you think that that sort of division of work, which we currently don't have in the document, is, is a useful way to go forward, uh, uh, please raise your hand. So I see two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I see twelve. 
something then uh, finish. If you object, if you think that's a, a bad idea and we should keep everything in one doc, or those things, the profiles and, or at least a couple of profiles and the framework in one document, uh, raise your hand. Okay, uh, I don't see anyone, so I think that's pretty clear. Um, okay, I think, uh, then of course a number of the questions don't make sense as such, <laughs> but um, I think. I think the next question could be what profiles are people interested in working on? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's, but that's um, not easily something that I can derive from the slide deck because, um, okay, so basically I have to now come up with some, pro with some profiles, essentially. Well, I mean, we could look at the individual slides and see what, what if people are interested in doing a transport layer security or application layer security. Right, we can use that, that as an indication of what, yes. uh, what profiles then come out at, at the end of the day. Okay, uh, maybe I do that. Not that it matters, but Jepper reports two additional hands to add to the 12 or whatever. So okay, I think good. Uh, Michael Richardson, I forget the person's name. Perfect. Um, okay, so um, maybe that, that's a useful question here on this slide. Uh, so I would like to understand your uh, sort of current focus on work on a solution that uses transport layer security um, and on an application layer execution and, uh, solution and I try to clarify that a little bit more when, when I use this term I'm talking about the communication between the client and the resource server um, and yeah and you can you can sort of like work for both and, and that's perfectly fine as one. Um, does that make question make sense to you? Do you feel comfortable with that? Okay, so you, have, you see in the diagram the client and the resource server talking to each other and uh, the question there is uh, what security mechanism should be used there? And initially we started off with using uh, DTLS slash DLS between those um, two points, but then we also added, uh, for example, uh, intermediates in between, and in some cases, uh, application layer solution, for example, co-op based on stuff that Gern has been working on, uh, may make sense in addition to, to DLS. Is that is that fair a summary? Yeah, an alternative could be to ask. Who think who wants to work on a transport layer security solution profile on transport? Yeah, that, that was an answer. And the second, who <laughs> wants to work on an application layer solution? Okay, so good. Um, so let me start with the transport layer security solution first. Um, so who, who's interested in 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 a transport layer security solution? Raise your hand. So we have uh, raise it a little bit further up there. One, two, three, four, five. Six, six, uh, six persons. Oh, that's good. Um, and an application layer solution. And we, I think, we are specifically talking about C, cozy based solution here. Uh, okay. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, nine. Uh, nine hands for that one. Um, okay. Okay. So um, I'm stepping ahead there, but at the end of the day, it would be good to have sort of these questions people answered. I mean, we, that, that could be the basis for uh, for design teams or for discussions around specific profiles. I don't know how to yeah. do that in a practical way. Yeah, and I, I, I also wonder um, specifically like, um, because we have this sort of separation between the work of the different working groups, but, um, Currently, uh, the work you're doing with what I call uh, um, co-op signing is is done in 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 uh, the core working group. Uh, so, could you explain a little bit on what the um, relationship to this? Um, so, like, where are the additional pieces of that work in this group, which we debated a little bit um, in the past on the on the list, but um, it was a little 
a little bit back and forth. Carsten Bowman, so basically, uh, if we want to secure Co-app, uh, we are not only securing uh, objects by themselves, we are securing the relationship uh, between a, a request and a response. Yep. And we also have to look at how we do this um, in the presence of proxies that provide some some services to these uh, objects. Right. And But that's what I referred loosely as co-op signing. Uh, and, and, but um, you also said that that work, the home of that work would be in the uh, core working group, right? So I'm interested in specifically on like, when it comes to a profile that specifically uses these application layer security, what does that actually mean for work in this group? Well, if, if work in this group tells us how to use COSI type containers, to carry around the security we need for ACE, then we probably can directly use this for, for the co -op related work. Mm -hmm. okay. So that, that's a very mm -hmm. fuzzy statement, I, yes, say, exactly. I know, but, okay. uh, but, I but it is that's something. the approach we should be going. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, I also um, think that I can derive a question from these deployment options. Um, so you, in these two cases, um, you have a scenario where, so what I'm trying to get to is um, whether you are specifically looking at scenarios that use token introspection where the resource server actually has some connectivity to the authorization server at the time of resource access. That's what I'm trying to get to, and whether there's interest to do that type of work versus the other model where the resource server verifies the token locally and doesn't uh, interact with any other server at that time. Does that make sense? Rephrase. Uh, so the question is, um, sort of actually two questions. Uh, I would like to hear who is interested in the model where the resource server contacts the authorization server at the time of resource access uh, using token introspection. Jim, um, does it make no sense to me? I, I'm try I keep trying to figure out what the use case is for doing the introspection side. Mm -hmm. Because basically, the reason why I see people wanting to do introspection is they want to offload the decision off the RS because it's overly constrained. But if it's over the constraint, I don't know that it really wants to be doing the, the, the communication back to the AS I can, in terms I can of power you, consumption. I can tell you what was, was told to me. Um, the reason why they want to do it is, is uh, twofold. The first thing is the communication, if you do use token introspection, you can actually use, instead of a self-contained token, you can use a reference, which keeps the over-the-air communication very small. Um, and the RS then uses a back channel, a separate channel. Uh, for example, in, in enterprise door lock scenarios, the, the door lock on the front side, it uses some radio interface, but on the back side, it's connected using, for example, Ethernet or something related to that. And also, the second uh, reason is to outsource the authorization uh, decision to uh, to the authorization server. So the, the RS implementation can actually be kept very simple, but has, uh, and the AES always has real-time information about what's going on. Okay, so I, I was mistaken in terms of, this is not actually generally thought of for a restricted RS case, it's more of a restricted C case. It, um, maybe if you can see it that way, possibly, yeah. Michael Richardson via Jabber, constrained devices are not always paired with constrained networks. Yep. Yeah. So that, that, that was the motivation, but, but maybe uh, it depends on what your use cases are or whether you find that interesting. That's why we try to do that exercise. So um, I could just add the word. One of the examples was as Jim pointed out here, a very constrained client. So it actually, I mean, it could be really be, I mean, you could perhaps, maybe you could think of NFC, for example, like C to RS. So it's, it's, it's really 
reference reference to some information about the client, and then the RS looks up what that what that is about. Okay, so first question about docking introspection. So who who is interested in that type of uh, deployment model? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four. I see four. Um, the other model is one where um, there's no token introspection, but the RS verifies the obtained token locally. It can make the authorization decision uh, locally. For profile, both of them, I don't think, makes make so, so much sense. Um, OK. so. So who is who? Who is more interested in in this um, local verification? If you will, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six. Interested? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Two, three, four, five, six. Six. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. That's uh, that's a good response. So I think um, if I if I can uh, summarize here is. There's definitely a preference for the uh, local verification here rather than for the uh, token inspection. Um, and and here I see interest for the uh, transport layer security and application layer solution. I see interest in both uh, type of models. Hannes, wasn't it four against six in in the case of the um, introspection versus local? I mean, it, it means oh, that that's, there, that's that's true. It's it means probably, that there are people interested yeah. in in both. So it's yeah, it's, um, you, you're correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, next point. That's uh, obviously a little bit more difficult. So there's these three different options that we currently list in the air for the credential types, and um, so I'm trying to find out on who has preference for which specific credential type. And of course, you can raise your hand multiple times. Um, later on, I'm, I think, sort of forming, in a, in a second phase, I'm, I'm trying to form sort of design teams to work together on different uh, profiles, but that will come, come afterwards. Um, so uh, RPK, IPSK certificates, X549 certificates. Uh -huh. So let's start with the uh, pre-shared secret based mechanism. So who's, who's interested to work on the pre-shared secret based mechanism? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, okay. Two, four, six, I see six. And um, I suspect um, we can probably add uh, the authors of the multicast security document to that as well because they're also using shared secrets. Mike Greeley from Robert Craigie. Are we trying to narrow the scope of the framework here or simply soliciting opinions on what might go into profiles? Um, uh, say that again. Question about your questions. Are you asking questions with people's hands in order to remove things from the framework document? Or are you trying to say what should be going into profiles? Okay, which, are you asking a, a framework yeah. question or a profiles question? I I'm asking, uh, question. I'm trying to in the end, I'm trying to figure out on um, which group of people should work on which profiles. All right, so that's the profiles question, profiles not about question. removing it from the framework. Okay. Well, it um, will, based on the early decision about the split between the framework and the profiles, we'll have to do some massaging on the framework to begin with, uh, which will remove stuff, uh, but uh, potentially. We, we don't know. We have to look through it and see uh, what we need to do there. To avoid having having uh, repetitive text, for example, the deployment scenarios don't make a lot of sense to list them in the framework document and in the profiles. In my opinion, but um, yeah, te text-wise, that that's one thing. But I think the important part here is that we we try to so, to address a different set of profiles, a set of profiles with some common denominator. That and that's the purpose of of this. I mean, otherwise we could just do a set of, of comp completely different uh, no, no. implementations. There's a common denominator, but we don't need to repeat uh, the profile text in the framework document as well as in the uh, profiles themselves. I... Okay, uh, that was, um, I asked for the British secret. Um, the raw public key, 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven. Uh, and the certificates? One, two, three. Three. So the certificates definitely uh, smaller group, three people for certificates. Okay. Um, I'm not fully sure how to ask this token transport question, but uh, to be honest. So either we go back to the, the list of different options, but I don't think that's meaningful. The question um, is maybe, I mean, this is very special. I think that they pointed out this is a special case. I think one question you could ask is, do people think it's useful to have this as a common, I mean, this should be the common token transport, which should be possible in, in any case. Is, is, it, is it useful to have that? Or maybe that's too early to make that, that, that maybe comes after we have profiles in place. I don't know. But this 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 is anyway the, the least common denominator between yeah. all the different profiles we could think of. Yeah. Do you, um, let me ask differently. Uh, when people look at this slide, uh, do they know what this what it means opposed to this authorization info endpoint? Who thinks that they know what this is about? Raise your hand. Okay, that's what I thought. Uh -huh. <laughs> Jabber question from Ludwig Seitz. Should post, sorry, should post to auth the info actually be part of the framework? Yeah, and I think the, the response that I just got was that um, maybe people are confused by all the different options. Maybe it's too premature. I think I would like to table that uh, decision for later. I think it makes no sense to ask people. It would be no meaningful discussion. And so I think the, the important thing here at the framework level is to say that there is a way for the client to establish some state that is associated with the security association that governs this thing. Yeah. And uh, one way to express this is posting to REST for resource, mm -hmm. but this can be expressed yeah. in different ways. And there are five different other ways. Um, okay. So, okay. Um, So in the, in the previous discussion, uh, we, I tried to figure out on whether what the use cases are in terms of uh, clock synchronization versus none. Um, and I would like to hear from you whether you consider uh, you, in your deployments having devices with synchronized clocks or not, regardless of what the solution then at the end looks like but just to get an idea on who would be interested to actually work on non-clock synchronized devices, okay? So who's interested in, um, in deployments that use devices with synchronized clocks? So the question is, who is interested in deployments where the uh, clocks of the device are synchronized? Not to, with some loose notion of synchronized, but uh, so typically what that would mean is you run the IoT device, when it starts up, it gets, uh, it has the real-time clock running, it gets talks to a server and, uh, let's say, uh, NTP, and gets that inf the time information, and uh, how accurately or not, uh, it sort of maintains that as a separate story, but it has uh, a synchronized clock with some other uh, node. So, who, who is considering that, those type of deployments? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, uh, 10 or 11. Mm -hmm. Okay, and for the other scenario, who's uh, looking at scenarios where this is actually not the case, where you don't have uh, clock synchronized devices? Uh, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five. I see five hands. Okay. Good. Um, Okay, uh, this is also a difficult one. Um, it's difficult because uh, the co-op versus HTTP is difficult because it's not just co-op HTTP because there are also other protocols uh, 
And also it's not just between the client and the resource server, but it could also be between the client and the authorization server. Um, so that makes it a, a somewhat difficult question to ask. But we don't really care, do we, about the client to authorization server? This, I mean, this question, at least the, the one I formulated was in terms of what is between client and resource server. Then there might be any type of communication, any type of communication security between CNAS and RSNAS. We, we would care, uh, but like if you have a constrained client um, and if you want it to work with others, uh, other, for example, authorization service and so on, you, you, it better runs the same protocols. Yeah, yes, sure. But what I meant was that we, the concern here is when, when it comes to the profiling, what, what, what protocol should be profiled for? Is people interested in profiling only for co-op or are people inter in, interested in making a profile also for HTTP? Uh, uh, Mohit, so I don't think they are entirely independent decisions. So depending on what you have between C and RS, that might influence also what you have between C and AS or, or the other way around. So that should talk about cable labs. So is this probably a case of where it's in the pro profile co-app versus HTTP? It could be co-app and co-app plus HTTP because it, it may be that that might be a better solution given most of the deployment scenarios. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point uh, because um, Okay, yeah, that's a good point. Um, so I don't think that there's enough work that has been done to compare uh, co-op on versus uh, embedded HTTP2 implementations to actually even answer that question. Um, so it's it's a little tricky. Uh, so I I don't so yeah so uh, co-op versus HTTP versus HTTP2 versus uh, some other protocols that we haven't talked about yet. Some people have uh, mentioned MQTT and other things, but I don't think, uh, like, the typical ones that we in the IDF uh, talk about. Jim. Uh, Jim Shuck. Um, I have a question on co-app versus HTTP. Are we talking in terms of for HTTP, pure HTTP, or as, as opposed to saying we're just going to transport co-app messages over HTTP? Because those are those are very different cases. Mm. No, I, I think I think we are talking about uh, HTTP. Uh, for example, the the typical case would be you have a non-constrained client like a smartphone or tablet. It uses HTTP to talk to the authorization server, uh, but then on the other uh, communication side from the client to the resource server, it uses, for example, co-op. Because um, the HTTP for that communication is easy is easy for developers to do. Uh, in, and may integrate nicely with uh, whatever favorite uh, cloud platform you have. Is that fair? Yeah, so uh, Kasimov, the, the, basically when we define something here, we should really think in terms of doing this over REST. And then there may be some, some minor details on how we map that abstract thing to co-op or to HTTP. But in the end, this is about uh, mapping the, the exchanges to REST. That, that's fair. Um, however, in, in terms of um, deployment use case, I think people have very specific uh, scenarios in mind and have also specific protocols they want to use in those environments. And, and a profile needs to, needs to say explicitly, like, does it use HTTP or CoA? Because otherwise, if two nodes speak different protocols, it won't work regardless of whether it's uh, RESTful or not. Yes, but I think the, the, the main point is that, that the, the bulk of the specification will be in doing eggs over REST. Right. And, and then we will have some, some additional profile stuff that says, oh, it's this option, it's this set or whatever. Yeah, OK. I, I would agree with that. This is Dave Robin. I would agree with that as much as possible, but that is an interesting point about um, the Auth Z info endpoint, which looks like a restful end, looks like a restful resource, but the only reason it's there is because it couldn't be done as a header, which it would be done in HTTP. That's true. So that's true. Yeah. I, I think you know we go. Oh, we have rest. We have a restful resource, but yeah. no, it's it's yeah. it's not a resource yes. at all because yes, it should suddenly. be an authorized yeah. header, bearer token, whatever. So so we did that. Uh, out of necessity. 
So the, my only point here wasn't to argue with Carson on that, but was to say that's an example of something that is a, a, a profile issue related to co-op and, and not being able to issue huge headers. Whereas in the HTTP profile, it would probably be sent as a header. Yes. So I, you know, I think that's what I'm, I was. I didn't jump before, but I would argue for keeping those kinds of things out of the framework and put them in the profile. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so th th there may be a, a style, a difference in style uh, in, in doing things because in, in HTTP, because the header is already a kilobyte, uh, you might as well put another kilobyte there and, and be happy. Uh, while on the core website, we may want to optimize things more and push things into a state um, in, instead of sending them with, with every request. Uh, now, th that's a continuum again. Um, of, of course, uh, auth Z info is not rest in the way Roy Fieldy would use that term because it really is state that is bound to the current security association. So it, it's really about establishing state on the server that is specific to a client it's talking to, which is the anathema of, of rest. So I, I'm, I'm curious what a with a question on, on co-op versus HTTP, HTTP2 would make any sense. I fear it won't. Um, I, I, will, I will skip that. What, what, maybe you have an idea. So I think it's pretty clear that we need to think about HTTP for the red arrows. Um, it's not so clear for me that there, there is a lot of uh, priority on, on doing for the black arrows, uh, but of course we should not design things in such a way to make it impossible. Okay. Your answer on the... Well, Hannes, why not ask the question anyway, see if people are interested in doing profile for HTTP. Just just a show of hands, see if there is any interest. Mm -hmm. So um yeah, so so is there so who who of you would be interested to work on a on a profile for HTTP? Uh, yeah. well I asked the uh, HTTP two afterwards. Uh, let's start with uh, plain HTTP HTTP one at one. So, uh, HTTP 1.1, who is interested? Two, okay, three, um, four, four, five. If I just wait longer, it will. <laughs> <laughs> um, and HTTP 2? One, two, three, four, five. It's the same five or? <laughs> No, it's not the same people. Jeff Relay from Michael Richardson. If HTTP client code is included in C, the client of the resource server, in order to speak to the AS, then the code is there. Okay, the server side of each could be omitted if we do co-app only for client to resource server, uh, but it seems like the AS can more likely support co-app than the other way around. Yes, theoretically, uh, that's definitely true. But, it, but uh, there's certain practical considerations on which uh, infrastructure you used. So there may be some issues. Okay. Yeah, I, I, that's another one. Uh, I'm not even going to ask that question. Okay, so um, I wish we had, um, we had some more possibility to talk about fight. So what I would like to get to at the end is I would like to figure out whether there are some people who could work together on um, very specific profiles. And and of course, I would like to have the names of those people um, so I can then at the next uh, ITF meeting and remind them on why uh, they failed to deliver what they said they would be doing. Um, that's why it's a pity because some of these people don't even show up then at the meeting. Uh, so, so, um, so I would like to spend a few minutes to come up with some profiles that uh, could be described. And I, I at least saw 
uh, one that was uh, a PSK based profile. It was. Um, Can you read that? So it's PSK, um, and then uh, Carsten helped me a little bit. Um, it was with, not with introspection, no introspection, introspection. plus uh, it was COA based. Yeah, so essentially, look at the way DKF does things, take out the, the cam, and uh, that, that would be the profile. Yeah, I'm trying to find out like uh, what I what I should describe here because if I ask a question, I it, uh, <laughs> I can't. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so is, is it, that a fair summary or N plus DLS? Yeah, DTLS. Uh, so okay. the, the 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 main point here is that the the uh, DTLS uh, authentication is actually based on the authorization mechanism. So you don't need a pre-established security association between the client and the research. In none, in none of those scenarios, yeah. Then in all others, you do. No, in, in all of the, the, the things that we are talking about, there's no pre-assumed uh, security association between the client and the resource server. Of, of, uh, yeah, of course not. Because that's well, the whole you, point. Usually, usually you, you, at some point, you make a connection from the client to the resource server. And there right. is some assumption that you can authenticate that connection. And that assumption is usually outside the scope of the current schemes that we are talking about. Mm, at, at the, the proposals that we have been debating about all use the uh, authorization server to create that uh, security context. So that the pre-established uh, secrets security was between the client and the resource server, the resource, no, the client and yeah. AS and the if uh, we resource can get server there, and AS, and great. that creates the security yep. for Perfect. the client. And uh, so I think that they are all the same, and the framework uh, I think describes that. So that they are, okay. they are good. But um, in order to have a few uh, documents, I, I need to know like um, some of those aspects that we just uh, talked about and put them together in a meaningful combination, and then ask people uh, whether they want. Uh, who is interested to contribute to those? That's what I, I'm trying to get to. And I think what I'm still missing here is the clock issue. Synchronized, uh, does, I, I don't remember, does DCAF rely on synchronized clocks in this scenario? No. How do you, how, do, how does the proposal then say whether uh, the, the ticket is valid? Well, there, there, the, there is a way to get a nonce from the resource server. So it, it's this um, event-based freshness concept okay event -based. pretty much yes okay so uh, non-synchronized clocks that's one possible combination okay then I create a second one uh, um, BK based And it, um, it uses co-op uh, between the client and the authorization server as well as between the client and the resource server? And the Seaboard ticket token. Seaboard COSI token. between the R's and uh, with no introspection, there's no protocol. Yeah. And here. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering whether it's the best use of our time to actually go through that. Um, I think probably not, um, because that it looks a little bit more complicated. So what I'm trying to then do is um, I will create a few 
profiles that are sufficiently different and um, proposed, post them to the mailing list and see on who of you would be interested to spend time on this and, and uh, come up with some description that at the level that it would be suitable for uh, introbability testing. Does that sound useful? Okay, good. Mike. Uh, so on the day failure as a Jabber relay, uh, Ludwig Seitz had asked, uh, said, said expressed interest in an RPK based one with non-synchronized clocks. And those are neither of your profiles right now. Okay. But otherwise it's identical to number two except for non-synchronized clocks is what he was interested in. Yeah, so okay, that means um, I think um, we should definitely look at the synchronized, non-synchronized, or the non-synchronized clocks issue. And uh, I'm trying to have a few persons, I put a few names written down to see on who could be working on this, specifically till the intro meeting, so we have a much better insight into what's going on there. So raise your hand if you volunteer to work on or investigate the issue of uh, non-synchronized clocks as we discussed earlier and during the meeting. So I see Dave. Oh, Ludwig. So that's something I'm, I'm a little bit worried. Uh, Dave, and uh, was, that, was that correct? Uh, um, the, uh, well, I, I need. I'm not asking a one versus two question. He's asking a non-synchronized clocks question, which may be part of number one and may be part of number three or whatever. Am that's I, that that's what I'm. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> yeah. Who wants to work on non-synchronized clocks? Yeah, because if if it shows up in many different profiles, then then it would be good to have some. I want, I want to have a short presentation at the next virtual intro meeting uh, about this topic to hear uh, what the story is. Yeah. So um, I, I don't know what non-synchronized clocks are because all clocks are non-synchronized to, to a certain level. But, but you know you know what I mean with that term. Yeah. I, I don't know what, the, what, what would be the better terminology. So um, th there are several switches you can switch off and on here. And what, one is whether you are referenced to an absolute time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, another is uh, what kind of accuracy the local clocks on on the systems have, and that's kind of orthogonal. I mean, if if you're referenced to an absolute time, and have good clock accuracy, uh, th then of course you 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 are in a good place. Uh, mm -hmm. But you might be referenced to absolute time and have a bad uh, uh, clock accuracy. So you have to both keep the information when you last synchronized to absolute time and uh, what, what your idea of current uh, times and so on. So th th there are many ways to skin this cat and I'm not sure it's just the two synchronized clocks, non-synchronized clocks. Yeah, as we discussed previously, but I need to give it a name for the purpose of uh, asking the question rather than repeating the whole story. So the, 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 I mean, the, the, the extreme is one where, where you uh, really entirely are uh, based on the sequence of events. Um, so you don't have any clock at all. And, and then you can start adding things uh, like an imprecise uh, uh, RC clock uh, that, that you can use, for instance, to extend the usefulness of an event over some time, because even with an inaccurate uh, clock, that's still a meaningful security result you get from that. And then you go into absolute time and, and so on. Uh, Thomas, I'd like to compliment uh, what Garshin just said. There is another case, which is between the I don't have a clock and I have a absolute time, is my network is synchronized, but I don't have absolute time. So within, within, my, IoT within my IoT devices, everybody knows what time it is uh, relative to one another, but that is not per se synchronized to UTC time. That's another case that, if possible, we could consider. We have the typical situation here. Um, we have some information that may be useful for authentication and or authorization. And that information may be authorized to be used for one purpose, but not be authorized to be used for another purpose. And there's a lot of fun in that. 
So I'm looking forward to that presentation. Um, and the question is, who is going to work on this? Uh, because I, I, so I see three people. Is that, is that, are you, uh, you added, you raised your hand, did you? Okay. What was your name again? I forgot it again. Thomas, exactly. So I have Thomas, Ludwig, uh, Novo. Okay, I'll, Navas, sorry. Navas. Okay, cool. That's at least uh, something. And um, I think that will help to, uh, or hopefully, the work that you're going to do will help to inform the rest of the group on what the different cases are and what uh, then different profiles could reuse so we have a, a better way to differentiate that. So I'm actually then deleting that from these things and then we add them later. Okay, good. Mike? Yes. <clears throat> good late afternoon, or good late morning, early afternoon. I'm Michael Jones from Microsoft, where I work on usually identity uh, and security related standards. Um, I'm here to talk about the Seabor web token draft, which Eric Wallstrom, myself, and uh, Hannes have worked on, which, as most of you know, is a Seabor and Cozy uh, equivalent of the JSON web token specification. Um, Eric wasn't able to be here, so I volunteered to speak to you. Thank you. Um, so there's a second public draft which has been around since November. Uh, the previous one we thought was going to go to the OAuth working group. Uh, our esteemed area director Kathleen uh, made a call in November that this work should be done in the ACE working group, which is great. Um, I'll note that there was also and continues to be significant interest uh, because of the applicability of the work from people in OAuth, COSI, OSE, et cetera. Um, the documents being worked on in Eric's GitHub account, some issues are filed. Um, there's a pull request about a, uh, uh, creating the registry of values. Um, and we're about to publish another version, incorporating a few minor fixes next. Um, so we'll add the registry for claims. We'll address the minor issues. Uh, so work is continuing apace. Uh, the main reason I'm here uh, in front of you is to ask the question, is it now time to adopt this still individual draft as a working group draft, especially based on Kathleen's call that we should do the work here. Okay, so um, who has had a chance to look at uh, this version or the one that uh, was submitted to OAuth? Raise your hand. Two people only. Hmm. Yeah, well, and, and I will note that Garen's architecture document has normative references to this. Um, that's sort of surprising because uh, on the one hand, we, we need to pass around uh, sort of information about what a, a specific entity is allowed to do, um, needs to carry in keying related information, etc., cetera, which was, uh, is currently specified as uh, the JSON web token, in, as the name says, in JSON. And there has been a lot of uh, uh, interest in, in not only in this group, but also in other groups to cut down on the size of uh, the messages, which uh, obviously Seabor would, um, would be able to do to that. 
and along with CBA, um, there's the need to use the different the, the corresponding security mechanism which is uh, worked on in, in COSI and which is what uh, this document uses. So I'm, I'm yeah. Michael Richardson volunteers to review it. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. So, Salander. So I had uh, only one concern on, on the, the development of, of, of this document, and that was sort of the timeline and how it, how it maps to the ACE timeline. Um, so, for example, we had today the discussion about non-spaced freshness, or, or that is nonce is used to, to, to um, provide information about uh, some information from, from the AES to the RS. And that would be information that needs to be passed in the access token. So there would be some nonce non claim, which isn't currently there. And uh, do you have any view on, I mean, do you have any view on the timeline here? Sure, let me speak to that. Um, that's a good question. The authors are intentionally scoping this document to being the CBOR equivalent of the JSON web token. Um, we think that that will accelerate the timeline because there's <clears throat> essentially very few choices to make. There's choices about CBOR encodings, but not about the claims to be represented. I think the most important thing for ACE and other communities using this work is to get it adopted and finished so that the registry is established so that claims for things like nonce or other application needed claims can be defined and registered in other documents. So indeed, I would hope that this uh, body would choose to adopt this soon so that we can move it along because ACE need it. I'm, I'm going to speculate for a moment as well. I believe a number of the people who are in the token binding working group, which is concurrent with this, uh, have also read this um, and worked on it, John Bradley, a, a few others. So um, also people in COSI, um, including the chairs, have looked at this in the past. So. Um so maybe maybe I can get a few reviewers uh, for the document to just have a few more eyes. So uh, is someone um, interested to uh, look at that document, the CEBO web token document? And Karsten raises his hand. Yeah. Anyone else? I'll also note that um, about six people have filed issues in GitHub, okay. all of which represent at least some form of review. Okay. Do you remember who, who that was? Um, the repository is in the deck. You can have a look. Yeah, okay. Let's have a quick look. Yeah. Oh, okay. Eric filed them based on mailing list comments. Yeah, so we would have to go through <clears> this. <throat> there, there is one pull request from. Well, we look at the pull request at the top. That's by an individual. Some, yeah. But um, we would have to go through the issues, which we don't do now. Sure, that's fine. Um, yeah, but Samuel but has clearly yeah. reviewed. So um, we have a few reviewers, and then we'll see. Uh, uh, what the resolution on this is and, and see how we uh, move forward on this or not. Otherwise, uh, we'll have to come up with a different token format if people think that that's not appropriate. Um, have to think about that. OK. So we have a few more minutes. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and since the authors of um, up in, neither up enough nor Sandeep are actually here at the meeting. I would just um, very briefly uh, point you to this uh, multi. Or it's called uh, 
multicast document. It's multicast, but it's actually a document describing um, low latency communication, specifically the keying uh, for it. So you could you could call this uh, a profile in some sense because it defines on um, how the existing or this uh, ACE OAuth framework can be reused and extended to support multicasting messages and it uh, specifically talks about one use case uh, from commercial indoor lighting. Um, it, what it, the extension um, or the, the architecture it proposes, it can be seen here. What it does is um, it relies uh, uh, on a couple of different pieces. So one is it um, sort of separates out a key, uh, the authorization server from a separate logical entity which does the key distribution for the multicast. Um, maybe the implementation wise it may in, be in the same box, it may be in a different one, but um, it uh, just separates those. And once these keys are then, so obviously the authorization part is responsible for making sure that you actually allowed to join these different groups and it talks about the different authorization permissions of those. And the second one is to um, deal with the distribution of the symmetric keys uh, needed for this multicast uh, handling. And then the last part, which is not specified in this document, but basically tables it on an application layer security solution is to have a way to secure the multicast messages um, to talk to the receivers. What is a little bit different um, compared to some of the other stuff that we had talked about previously is that in a multicast message you are less likely to send the token, access token already um, with the message, with the multicast message uh, every time, needless to say. And so the solution there is to um, have the key distribution to happen or the access token uh, distribution mechanism to happen that independently uh, to the respective senders and receivers. So that's that's the uh, subtle difference there. Um, yeah. So it's a it's a it's a little bit of a different model. Um, it also um, provides these examples from the lighting uh, sector. Yeah. And the reason the reason why this authorization and uh, key distribution is separated into two logical entities is uh, simply because of uh, sort of practices used in sort of this commercial lighting environment where uh, there are separate dedicated guys rocking around these installers or commissioners who then provision these uh, devices and they may have um, not necessarily where you in smaller installations you may not only have um, literally an authorization server online all the time uh, but instead do the authorization step once and then um, the, the distributed sort of uh, manis manifestation of that authorization decision in form of these access tokens is actually then uh, longer lasting and uh, provided with the devices. With, uh... Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not a specific comment to this one, but. Um, the final word, at least for me, on the discussion today, and I think it's been very good with the interest for all the different, um, all the different aspects of different profiles. What um, I just want to say: don't just go go home and do a profile which is not somehow. I mean, related to what we have been discussing here, because the attempt we we started out was something that that we can have a common denominator among different different profiles so so please think about what we have what we've started out here and and let's together find the common denominators which makes this uh, a useful framework not only for the profiles that we are writing but to extend to other profiles and other deployment settings mm -hmm. as well yeah okay so I think we we have finished here with this. Um, so have a look at this at this work if you if you care about uh, this low latency group communication uh, topic. Have a look at it. It's it's an it's a current proposal. There are obviously many different changes uh, that are possible, but just something that is that was written up 
uh, as part of an um, a consortium focusing on this lighting on this lighting industry. Uh, Philips, Sum uh, and some others. Tridonic. Okay, thank you guys. Can you send me? Them? You sent me the meetings then. Meeting minutes. Okay. Okay. For when do you want? Uh, as soon as possible. Okay. Blue sheets. Yeah. Because in Cozy, there was a lot of interest. Yeah. That's a good question, yeah. And I'm not asking them to do that, but we need to, to advertise. Uh, to advertise that people yeah. say yeah. on the ace list that it's interesting to see. Yeah. Which yeah. probably means that Cafe needs to ask the question. Yeah, he definitely does. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But thanks, thanks for the presentation. Yeah, no Uh, what he uh, he didn't be committed, I think. Well, yeah, it wasn't over on the no. screen. Over okay, uh, we probably should have done that. Uh, that, that uh, okay, I was just wondering, was, it, was it the box wasn't working? Was no, no, no. I, I I had some hassle with the, the display. I don't know where that came from, so I, I totally forgot the other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, Peter. Hi, good to see you. Great How is life? Yeah. Oh, very well. uh, Sandeep, I sent you a message that you wouldn't come and you had answered it. Oh, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> that happens, yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, the blue sheets are, did you, you didn't I sign didn't a blue sheet? Uh huh. <laughs> What time the next meeting? The next meeting is going to start at two. two. Okay. Uh, There's a lunch break in between. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm 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 done with this meeting. I will then. Uh, it would be a different guy. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you.